But we continue in our worship as we turn to his holy word. And Deuteronomy will be in chapter 19. We'll be reading the entire chapter today as we continue on in our sermon series. Let's hear from the Lord this morning. When the Lord your God cuts off the nations whose land the Lord your God is giving you and you dispossess them and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall set apart three cities for yourselves in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. You shall measure the distances and divide into three parts the area of the land that the Lord your God gives you as a possession so that any manslayer can flee to them. This is the provision for the manslayer, who by fleeing there may save his life. If anyone kills his neighbor unintentionally without having hated him in the past, as when someone goes into the forest with his neighbors to cut wood, and his hand swings the axe to cut down a tree, and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies, he may flee to one of these cities and live, lest the avenger of blood in hot anger pursue the manslayer and overtake him because the way is long, and strike him fatally, though the man did not deserve to die since he had not hated his neighbor in the past. Therefore I command you, you shall set apart three cities. And if the Lord your God enlarges your territory as he has sworn to your fathers and gives you all the land that he promised to give to your fathers, provided you are careful to keep all this commandment, which I command you today by loving the Lord your God and by walking ever in his ways, then you shall add three other cities to these, three, lest innocent blood be shed in your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, and so the guilt of bloodshed be upon you. But if anyone hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him and attacks him and strikes him fatally so that he dies and he flees into one of these cities, then the elders of his city shall send and take him from there and hand him over to the avenger of blood so that he may die. Your eyes shall not pity him, but you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel so that it may be well with you. You shall not move your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set in the inheritance that you will hold in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witness, witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dis dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then he shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Let's pray. Father God, we, as we just sang, you are a holy God, and in, in you there is no shadow or turning, God. There's no sin, and God, your expectation and your requirement is perfection. And so God, we pray today that as we turn to your word, that we would see you here, Lord that we would see your, your holiness, we would see your grace, we would see Jesus, Lord. And God, I pray as Pastor Trent gets up, God, that you would give him recall, God. I pray that you would give him clarity of thought, that you would give him everything that he needs to deliver your message to us today as your people. And I pray all this in Jesus' powerful name, amen. You may be seated. Lord, can you give me You know, a scripture reading like that might test the limits of a lesser people than you. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I love being a covenant church, because you're all people of the word and you love the word, even when it can be difficult or challenging to understand. Well, the devil lived in the Tug Fork Valley of the Appalachian Mountains. He was born in a log cabin in 1838 and lived a pretty rough and tumble existence, hard as the hickories that surrounded him there. He never learned to read, but despite that, he ran a successful 
timber business, all the while raising 13 children. Life was pretty good for the devil. Until that day in 1878, when a man by the name of Randolph McCoy accused the devil's cousin, Floyd Hatfield, of stealing some of his hogs. The case went all the way to the local courts where a jury made up of six Hatfields and six McCoys found Floyd Hatfield innocent of the charge of hog thievery. Well, this did not settle the matter. In fact, the McCoys were flaming mad and actually killed the one McCoy on the jury who sided with the Hatfields. Tensions continued to mount between the two families over the next several years until that fateful day in August of 1882 when the anger and hatred boiled over. It was election day at Blackberry Creek, and somehow the devil's brother, Ellison Hatfield, found himself in a conflict with three of the McCoy boys. In the melee that ensued, the McCoys stabbed Ellison Hatfield 20 times and then shot him. The Hatfields came, rescued Ellison, brought him back home, but the devil swore, if Ellison dies, I'm going to kill them, McCoy boys. Ellison did die, and the devil was true to his word. He went and captured those three McCoys, tied them to some pawpaw bushes, and summarily executed them. That, of course, was the end of the matter. No, it wasn't. The McCoys struck back and the Hatfields struck back, and over the next 28 years, more than 15 people died in the Hatfield and McCoy family feud. It's maybe the most famous family feud, but it's not the only family feud, and it wasn't the last family feud, and it's maybe not even the worst family feud. Throughout the course of human history, we see this same scene and scenario played out over and over again. A harm is done. Intentionally or unintentionally, it's done. Somebody strikes back, tries to make it right to get even, typically goes overboard. They strike back again, and this escalating violence and and cycle of retaliation leads to the destruction of families and communities and even nations. The fact is, in a sinful world, there will be harm done to people, whether it's intentional or unintentional. The question is, how can we keep the the, the cycle of violence and retaliation from spinning out of control? How can a just society keep that from consuming the people? And on a more personal level, how do we personally respond to the harms that are done to us, either intentionally or unintentionally? Well, that's why we took the time to read chapter 19 of Deuteronomy today, because this passage actually gives us some very practical instruction on those very topics. Now, if you remember where we are in Deuteronomy, this section of Deuteronomy roughly traces the Ten Commandments. Over the last several weeks, we were looking at Moses' exposition of the Fifth Commandment, to honor your father and mother. And so he was dealing with other kinds of authorities in society, like judges and priests and prophets and kings. Now, this week, we've made a shift into talking about implications of the Sixth Commandment, which is, of course, you shall not murder. Probably a better translation of the Hebrew intention here is something like, you shall not kill unlawfully. There's distinctions made, as we'll we'll see. The prohibition here against the taking of life has some necessary qualifications that we'll be exploring as we go through the morning. But essentially, what this passage is driving at and aiming to do is it's aiming to both ensure that justice is done in the midst of a people, but that justice is not done in such a way that threatens to actually damage the innocent in their midst. So in this passage, Moses is going to give us some very practical instruction under the spirit power of the Holy Spirit that aims to restrain evil, 
to protect the innocent and ultimately to limit the shedding of blood in a society. And Lord knows most of our societies could benefit from the instruction that Moses extends here. Even as the guilty are, are punished and the innocent are protected, they are to be guided by this overarching rule that's known sometimes as the, the lex talionis that's given to us in verse 21. It says this, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. You maybe have heard that verse. You maybe have seen it also in the Sermon on the Mount and you may think you know what it means and you very likely are wrong because it's mostly misinterpreted. And so as we go through this, hopefully we will get a clearer understanding of what Moses means by this, as well as what Jesus means by it when he speaks about it in the New Testament. Now, before we go any further, let me just say this. We, as the United States of America, are not in a covenant relationship with God, contrary to some popular books out there. And we are not, therefore, to simply take the civil law that was given to the people of Israel and apply it to our American system of justice. God's covenant is with his people from all around the world, made up of every tongue, tribe, language, and nation. However, we do live in a land where we have some say in the governance and in the laws of our lands, and we would be wise to take the wisdom that God has given to his covenant people in this passage and bring those principles to bear as we're able in our own legal system. Beyond that, the principles that are laid out here that are really to govern the society of the people of God here in Israel actually also have relevance for how we govern in our churches and even for how we govern in our own homes. So we'll try to draw out some of those implications today, though my main focus is gonna be on how these laws can inform us as a society. So the first principle that this passage is driving at is that we must protect the innocent. We must protect the innocent if we're going to be a just society. Any government that does not protect its innocent citizens is not worthy of the name. This is one of the fundamental reasons for which a government exists is to protect the innocent that the righteous might flourish in a place. Part of protecting the innocent means judging, purging the guilty. Now these two things can sometimes be in tension. Sometimes in the effort to purge the guilty, if we become overzealous about getting all of the guilty, we might accidentally punish the innocent. And that must not happen, this passage makes clear. Likewise, in our efforts to protect the innocent, we may end up letting the guilty go free. Biblically speaking, that seems to be a preferable situation, but not ideal either. What we learn about God is that he describes himself in Exodus 40, 34 this way. He says that he is a God who will by no means clear the guilty. But likewise, in this passage, he goes out of his way here to protect the innocent. And so we need to uphold and maintain both of these things as best we're able as a society, but also in our churches and in our homes. This is what good government does. So let's talk about the ways in which this passage says we need to protect the innocent. First of all, it says we need to protect human life. And verses one to three describe uh, these cities that are called cities of refuge. And they're to be established in three places as they cross into the land that are essentially roughly divided in the land so that Everyone has equal access to get to these cities. And the purpose of these cities is for a person who accidentally killed somebody, called a manslayer, in order to be able to run to that city and find refuge before somebody else called the avenger of blood comes and kills them. So that's what the cities exist for. Now, we get some more description of that in verses four to six. Let's read that. He writes, this is the provision for the manslayer who by fleeing there to the city of refuge may save his life. And here's the kind of situation for which the, the cities of refuge exist. If anyone kills his neighbor unintentionally without having hated him in the past, as when someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood and his hand swings the ax to cut down a tree and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies. Amazingly specific, isn't it? as in just saying such a thing happened. 
He may flee to one of these cities and live, lest the avenger of blood in hot anger pursue the manslayer and overtake him because the way is long and strike him fatally, though the man did not deserve to die since he had not hated his neighbor in the past. So these cities need to be established at regular intervals so that somebody can flee to them if, in fact, they had accidentally killed somebody because it's really important that somebody who accidentally killed somebody not be killed. Because to the bloodshed that's already happened, more bloodshed would then come upon the land and the people. The man who accidentally kills someone, we read in verse 6, did not deserve to die. Now, what that tells us is that there are some who do deserve to die, and we're going to talk about them in just a moment. But the one who accidentally kills a person, that person did not deserve to die, and these cities were there to protect not only the innocent person who accidentally killed somebody, but to protect all the people from bringing the guilt of innocent blood upon the people. This is a concept with which we are not very familiar, the idea of, of guilt that comes upon a whole people, but the Bible clearly speaks of this, and this is one of the problems with shedding innocent blood. And when we think about our own country and the shedding of innocent blood, this is something that should give us pause and lead us to our knees in prayer for ourselves. Now, when somebody is killed... It was the responsibility of the next of kin to rectify the situation. They're called here the avenger of blood. The word in Hebrew literally is the redeemer of blood. The word is goel. And the redeemer of blood or the avenger of blood, they had a responsibility to their next of, of kin, and there was an order of these relationships, to redeem them if they should become enslaved, uh, to take care of their widow and children if they should die, to redeem their property, and ultimately to avenge their death if they are killed wrongfully. And so when the person dies, the avenger of blood rises up, and they come, and they go to rectify the situation, and the manslayer is fleeing, and it's important that these cities be close enough that they not be overtaken on the way. That's what this is being uh, described here. So that it says in verse 10... Here again is what's being protected against. Lest innocent blood be shed in your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, and so the guilt of bloodshed be upon you. God and Moses want to protect the people from bringing the guilt of innocent blood upon them. And ultimately, as we'll see, the only way to rid them of the guilt of innocent blood upon them is by shedding the blood of the one who brought the innocent blood upon them. Now, when we think about the commandment, the sixth commandment, thou shall not kill or kill unlawfully. Uh, most of us, when we're waking our way through the 10 commandments and we're confessing our sins, say, we come to the sixth commandment and this is one commandment where we all breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> At least I'm not guilty of this one. You know, the others maybe, you know, but when it comes to not kill, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't broken that commandment. But that's a misunderstanding of how the Ten Commandments function in the life of God's people. You see, as we can already tell, working our way through Deuteronomy, these passages are actually expounding what the Ten Commandments entail. And the Ten Commandments not only prohibit certain things, but by prohibiting certain things, they actually are commanding other kinds of things. And we have a document in, in our denomination called the, the Westminster Larger Catechism. And one of the sections of the catechism uh, works its way through the implications of the various commandments, including both what is forbidden and what is commanded in the commandments. And so in the larger catechism question and answer 135, there is this extended description of what the sixth commandment, you shall not kill unlawfully, actually requires us to do. And it's long and difficult, but I'm going to read the entirety of it for you. So gird up the loins of your mind for this because it's good. Here's what it says. What are the duties required in the sixth commandment? The duties required in the sixth commandment are all careful studies and lawful endeavors to preserve the life of ourselves and others by resisting all thoughts and purposes 
subduing all passions and avoiding all occasions, temptations, and practices which tend to the unjust taking away the life of any. By just defense thereof against violence, patient bearing of the hand of God, quietness of mind, cheerfulness of spirit, a sober use of meat, drink, medicine, sleep, labor, and recreation, by charitable thoughts, love, compassion, meekness, gentleness, kindness, peaceable, mild, and courteous speeches and behavior, forbearance, readiness to be reconciled, patient bearing and forgiving of injuries and requiting good for evil, comforting and securing the distressed and protecting and defending the innocent. This is what the commandment thou shalt not kill unlawfully is about. Ultimately, the protection and the preservation of life and working its way all the way back to the beginnings of murder and where it begins. So how are you doing on the sixth commandment? <laughs> Probably we've discovered that there are areas that we need to address that, that, that maybe we are not actively protecting and preserving life as the sixth commandment and these other passages in Deuteronomy as well as the New Testament would be encouraging us to do. So fulfilling the sixth commandment involves things like Standing up for the end to abortion in our country. That's part of what it means to fulfill the sixth commandment through the taking of innocent life, one of the the worst ways that's been happening in our nation and around the world. It also means seeking to see those freed who are on death row who've been convicted unjustly. That's part of what it means to fulfill the sixth commandment. It means working to ensure that working conditions are safe for people. It means looking at all of those things in our society that might lead to the unjust or unnecessary taking of human life and asking, what can I do to help protect and preserve life? How can I personally as an individual be my brother's keeper when it comes to matters of life? These things are all entailed when when we're talking about the fact that we must protect life. The second thing this passage addresses is that we must protect private property. Now, this is a bit strange, perhaps as Pastor Chris was doing the reading, you found yourself saying like, what does this have to do with anything? And uh, I hope to show you, but he says in verse 14, you shall not move your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set in the inheritance that you will hold in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. So we've been talking about cities of refuge that exist for people who accidentally kill somebody so that they don't also get killed. We're bound to talk about false witnesses and how we deal with those kind of accusations. And sandwiched in the middle here is this seemingly random verse about not moving landmarks. What is this about? Well, as then as today, land is divided by landmarks. And one way for me to increase my land pretty easily is to take the mark that divides my property from yours and just move it over a little bit. I can add a whole row of crops. I can get a particular fruit tree now in my property as opposed to yours. There's a number of beneficial things that I can do by moving boundary markers. And interestingly, the the Old Testament condemns this practice in the severest terms on multiple occasions. It's a really big deal. It's effectively stealing. And it may seem to us that it fits more properly under the section that's going to do with stealing. But remember this about the sixth commandment. The sixth commandment not only is forbidding killing, but it's also forbidding the kinds of actions that lead people to get killed. Remember, 135 says, the duties required in the sixth commandment are all careful studies and lawful endeavors to preserve the life of ourselves and others by resisting all thoughts and purposes, subduing all passions and avoiding all occasions, temptations and practices which tend to the unjust taking away the life of any. You move my property boundary and we've moved one step closer to the end, right? Have we seen in history or in the world around us at any point in time, people getting killed over property disputes? Yes, it happens all the time at the local level and even at the national level. 
This is a major issue when it comes to the shedding of blood and the shedding of innocent blood. And so Moses here points out, this is a practice that ought not to be done. And it is the responsibility of of governments to ensure that people's personal property rights are protected. This is part of the way we save the land from the shedding of innocent blood. Moving on from that, the third thing he addresses then is the importance of protecting the falsely accused. Reading verses 15 to 20, he says, A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. This is the concern to protect the innocent. One witness is not enough. We need to be corroborated because we might accidentally punish somebody who is in fact not guilty. So this is why I say that if we're going to err, it seems like the Bible would direct us to err possibly on the side of letting the guilty get off with something rather than accidentally punish somebody who is innocent. And I think the reason why the Bible does that is because God knows that a day of judgment is coming. And while the guilty may escape justice in this world, they will not ultimately escape justice. And so I think that should inform our own thinking. And in fact, I think it does inform the way that the law operates in our land, which is wonderful. Verse 16, if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who were in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently. And if the false witness, if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. So if for whatever reason, people begin to suspect that this witness isn't being honest, not telling the truth, bringing a false accusation, then the judges are to do an extensive investigation into the matter. And if in fact it turns out that this is a false accusation or a false witness, that somebody's lying under oath, so to speak, then this person is to be dealt with in the same way that that person meant to hurt the falsely accused. Now this provision does a couple of things. One, it purges the guilty by addressing the sin and the guilt that the false witness has brought upon the people. But secondly, it serves to protect the innocent because what all of the people see and hear and fear is that if I act as a false witness, there's going to be serious consequences for me. And so again, in any society that aims to protect the innocent, there need to be laws and things in place to help protect against the temptation to making false accusation and false witness against people. Again, the aim in verse 20 is that the rest will hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. This has obvious implications for how our own court systems work and so on, both in the world and also how it works in the context of our church courts. But let's move beyond that for a second and just consider the fact that the only way to bear false witness is not just in the courts of law. It's possible for us to do damage and to assassinate people and to destroy people with our words quite apart from being in a court of law. We can slander people, we can gossip people, we can ruin people in the court of public opinion, and we maybe even can do more damage that way than by bringing a false charge against them in the court of law. The Bible says that as God's people, we need to protect against that, and we need to deal with that severely, justly, whenever it arises. So that's the first aspect that Deuteronomy 19 is about. We must protect the innocent and ensure that there are structures in place in our society, in our church government, in even in our homes, that the innocent are protected. That's only half the equation. The second half is that we must purge the guilty. We must purge the guilty. Picking back up with the situation of the cities of refuge, we read in verse 11, but if anyone hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him and attacks him and strikes him fatally so that he dies and he flees into one of these cities, 
Then the elders of his city shall send and take him from there and hand him over to the avenger of blood so that he may die. Your eye shall not pity him, but you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel so that it may be well with you. The existence of the cities of refuge are not for intentional murderers. And if a person flees to the city of refuge, that doesn't mean that they're forever safe. It means that they are temporarily safe to protect them from vigilante justice until a proper trial can be commenced. And so when they're in the city of refuge, the elders are to do a proper investigation into the circumstances of the death of the person. And if in fact that person is innocent, then they need to stay in that city of refuge for a certain period of time. And the period of time they need to stay in the city of refuge is until the high priest dies. And we think that sounds like a very strange sentence. It could be a year, it could be 20 years, who knows how long that could be. Why is that a thing? Well, there seems to be some sense in which the death of the high priest in the land serves to expiate the guilt of innocent blood from the land. And so once that blood is removed through the death of the high priest, then the person, the manslayer, is now free to leave the city of refuge and is not to be harmed. If a person is in the city of refuge who actually is guilty of murder, and here's what we see that defined as, he hates his neighbor. There's some premeditation here. There's a motive being driven. He lies in wait for him. There's a plan and he's thinking consciously, premeditating, doing this action and attacks him and strikes him fatally so that he dies. There is follow through on the plan and he actually intentionally brings this person's life to an end. Then this person is to be taken out of the city of refuge and he is to be delivered over to the avenger of blood and that family is to kill him. Now that is not vigilante justice and it's not even vengeance, it is justice in the society in which it existed. And it was right. As we go back to the, uh, the Westminster Larger Catechism, we see that, that killing and this motive of hatred is something that Jesus picks up on and makes a connection with in the Sermon on the Mount. He says that anyone who hates his brother, is breaking the sixth commandment. And that's exactly what the larger catechism reminds us, that, that what the sixth commandment requires of us is charitable thoughts, love, compassion, meekness, gentleness, kindness, peaceable, mild, and courteous speeches and behavior, forbearance, readiness to be reconciled, patient bearing and forgiving of injuries. Uh, this is what we are called to do. And when we are breaking these things, we ultimately are making our way down to murder. And when murder happens, what the scripture says here is that one needs to be punished and the punishment is death. And in this way, the guilt of innocent blood is taken away from the land. So let me ask you this question. Should we still practice capital punishment in a civilized society like ours today? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and here's why. Because to kill another person in the way that this scripture describes is to destroy the image of God from the earth. It is the consummate sin of humanity which requires the consummate penalty. And the passage warns us against what can keep a people from removing the guilt of innocent blood from the land. In verse 13, he explicitly says, your eye shall not pity him, but you shall purge the guilt of innocent blood from Israel so that it may be well with you. If they do not deal with this sin, if they do not bring justice to the situation and rectify it, it will not be well with the people. 
the principle for why death is required in the case of someone who intentionally kills another human being was set all the way back in the book of Genesis chapter nine. God says to Noah, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. It doesn't say by God shall his blood be shed. It says that man has the responsibility to execute this justice against the intentional murderer. And so that's what's, of course, being described here. Now, when we come to the New Testament, does this get overturned somehow? Does this get written off? No. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in speaking about the role of civil authorities, tends actually gives support to the role of the civil government in enacting this kind of justice in the case of intentional murder. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 13 that the, the government, so to speak, is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger. Interesting language there, isn't it? an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. No longer is this to be handled in the context of families, but the civil government has a role to play in being the avenger of blood when innocent blood is shed in a land. They do not bear the sword in vain. And when a government does bear the sword in vain and does not do what the Bible says, calls all people to in the case of murder, well, then the government is failing to live up to the purposes for which the sword has been entrusted to it. This is not talking about personal vengeance. This is not talking about how we personally retaliate to people who have wronged us or hurt people in our families. That's not what this is talking about. We're talking about the role of the civil government in bearing the sword that aims to limit bloodshed by actually shedding the blood of those who have shed innocent blood. Now, despite what Deuteronomy says and what Paul says in the book of Romans, there are many people, both Christians and non-Christians alike, who do not think that capital punishment is something that should be done in society today. And I'll share with you just one representative of that view. You might have heard of him. His name is Pope Francis. And uh, this is what he said in a statement a number of years ago, and I just want to uh, address this statement because it, it, it captures some of the unbiblical thinking that goes behind uh, Christian opposition to the death penalty. So let me read it for you. He says, the death penalty is unacceptable, however grave the crime of the convicted person. It is an offense to the inviability of life and to the dignity of the human person. It likewise contradicts God's plan for individuals and society and his merciful justice. Nor is it consonant with any just purpose of punishment. It does not render justice to victims, but instead fosters vengeance. The commandment, thou shalt not kill, has absolute value and applies both to the innocent and to the guilty. It must not be forgotten that the inviolable and God-given right to life also belongs to the criminal. So in response to that statement, we just point out a few things. Uh, first of all, um, to carry out the death penalty does not run contrary to the inviability and dignity of life. And why do I say that? I say that because God, who is the author of life and holds it to be sacred, actually commands the death penalty to be used in a number of specific instances. And I'm not prepared to call God contradictory with himself. Secondly, we can't not say that the commandment, thou shalt not kill, forbids the just execution of murderers we can't say it includes that because the very same books of Exodus and Deuteronomy that command thou shalt not kill unlawfully actually command the taking of certain lives. And I'm not prepared to say that the Bible contradicts itself on this point. In fact, there's a unified testimony throughout it. Furthermore, 
He argues that it will create a sense of vengeance in the, in the victims, but that may or may not be the case, but that's a separate issue from the principle of justice and just retribution that the government has a responsibility to execute on evil doers. For these reasons and a number of others, we need to understand that particular line of argument against capital punishment as being, frankly, unbiblical. It's wrong. And it's not just an alternative Christian view, that particular line of argumentation. It's just wrong. It's just contrary to the Bible. Now, there are Christians who oppose the death penalty today. The best reason for which they do so is that it's been unjustly applied in our own society, particularly to minorities and to the poor. And that's a real problem. And that needs to be rectified and it needs to be made right. And a number of things have happened over the years to try and rectify that situation. But there might still be a Christian who says, until that's rectified, I can't stand for that. I can't support it. I understand that. But I don't think the answer is to say that we do away with the death penalty. I think the answer is that we make sure that we are applying the death penalty in ways that are consistent across the board and that the amount of one's money or the color of one's skin does not allow you to get away with murder when what the Bible calls for is the shedding of your own blood for shedding blood. So that's how I'm thinking about it. And that's how well, we're spending time on this. You're like, wow, I didn't think I was coming to church today to learn about the death penalty and why I should support it as a Christian. I understand. But what we're aiming to do as believers each time we gather for worship and open God's word is to learn to think according to the scriptures and to let our mind be shaped by what the scripture says. Because here's, what, here's what's happening. We live in a world right now where if you want to join the EU, you cannot explicitly, cannot have the death penalty. And that same EU are the, are, the, are the people who are lecturing the United States for our Supreme Court ruling on abortion. That you cannot execute a criminal who is guilty of shedding innocent blood, but you absolutely must preserve the right of people to shed the blood of unborn babies. That's not biblical thinking. And, I, and I'm not trying to, I understand we have people here who don't, who don't agree with anything I've just said. And I, I'm glad you're here. I'm not trying to put you off. I, but I'm trying to teach the people of God how to think, not in terms of culture and how our culture is thinking, but in terms of what the scripture says, because that's how we need to engage. Now we need to then, as we deal with people and we talk to them gently, correct, and try to point people our way and understand that everything that's taught in the Bible is not gonna make its way into our civil laws as a society, but the right to life and the recognition of the value of life we want to do everything we can to see that enshrined in, in uh, the society in which we live. Now, in verses 13 and in verse 21, there is again this command, your eye shall not pity him. The temptation will be in the case of false witnesses who maybe have witnessed against somebody who deserve death because they were ultimately trying to get somebody to be put to death like they did with Jesus by being false witnesses or the person who has unjustly murdered someone, the temptation will be, because this may have been a family member, may have been somebody close, your eye shall not pity him. You cannot stand in the way of this justice coming upon uh, the people. But this, is, this execution of justice and the purging of the guilty, it needs to be measured. And that's what verse 21, the lex talionis, is all about. This is what it says in verse 21. Your eye shall not pity, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for for foot. The typical way of reading this passage is to say that what this passage is prescribing is personal vengeance and revenge. But actually what this verse is aiming to do is actually limiting personal vengeance and revenge and the escalating nature of retaliation. What this verse is saying is that if you knock out my tooth, it does not give me the right to knock out all of your teeth, which is typically what happens. It says, what this passage is teaching is that justice, it needs to be proportional to the crime. 
And proportionate means if a life is taken unjustly, it means death. But for a property crime, one's life should not be taken. That's essentially the, the, the kind of thing that, that this law is aiming to do. Now, when we come to the New Testament, does Jesus overturn the lex talionis? Does he overturn eye for an eye? It sounds like he does. In the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. There are people who read that verse, like one of my favorite authors, Leo Tolstoy, who's an amazing writer, but not theologically reliable, <laughs> who takes this verse and says that what this means is, we cannot resist evil in any way. It means that there should be no police, there should be no soldiers, there should be uh, ultimately no government. We should not try to resist evil, it's what Jesus says, therefore it's what we should do. Now, there, that's an extreme view. There are other people who have less extreme views and who say, based on what Jesus says here, we should be pacifists. We're gonna talk about that somewhat next week. There are people who, based on this view, say we shouldn't have things like capital punishment uh, and so on. Well, is that what Jesus is saying here in this passage? The answer is no, that's, that's not what he's driving at. You see, the principle that was given in Deuteronomy 1921 about eye for an eye, that principle was given with regard to how the society is to respond and to carry out judgment against wrongdoers. It was never intended to be a law for personal retaliation. But by the time of Jesus, people had taken the law that was meant to restrain the civil government from unjust over punishing people, and they had begun to use it as a mandate for why I'm going to knock out your tooth if you knock out mine. Jesus is speaking about personal retaliation. And what he says in the context of personal retaliation is that Christians are not to do it. But if someone slaps you on the cheek, you turn the other cheek also. It does not mean if a person kills an innocent victim that the government should say, that's too bad, we can't do anything about it, our hands are tied, we can't resist evil. No, in fact, if the government does not do something about it, the, the government that God has appointed to bear the sword, if they bear that sword in vain, what ends up happening is the people take the law into their own hands. And you end up with vigilante justice and escalating types of retaliation and all kinds of mess. That's why the government must bear the sword and it must bear it rightly and justly, lest more innocent blood be shed. As individuals, we forgive those who sin against us. Whether it was intentional or unintentional, we are not to harbor resentment. We are not to allow our anger to go on and continue. We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. That does not mean that there is not sometimes an appropriate place for legal action. We know the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that in some cases we should choose to be defrauded by somebody rather than take them to the secular courts. But in other cases, it would be unwise and unloving to not take someone to the secular courts. For example, in the recent sexual abuse cases, this has been the great mistake that's been made by churches. In trying to protect uh, the, the, the guilty, they've exposed the innocent to more and more abuse, which is exactly the opposite of what a government exists to do. Now, they were trying to follow the principle of not handling things in secular court, but there are some crimes that need to be dealt with in the context of the secular court, murder being one of them, sexual abuse being another. The Bible strikes an amazing balance between the necessity and importance of protecting the innocent and making sure that we're not punishing people who are not guilty, and at the same time, not being soft on crime, but ensuring that justice is done because it's only as justice is executed rightly that we can prevent the escalation of violence and bringing more and more bloodshed upon a land and people. So that's what this passage is about. Now, circling back all the way to the devil again. 
The devil was responsible for a great deal of bloodshed, as were others. His hands were not clean. Innocent blood was shed upon him and upon others. He didn't have the nickname, the devil, for no reason. But he had a friend from his days when he served in the Confederate Army by the name of Dyke Garrett. And Dyke Garrett had had a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. And he was aflame with gospel love and passion. And against what all of us might have considered not very wise, he brought the good news of Jesus to Devil Ants Hatfield. And he invited him to come along with him to a revival meeting. And at the end of that meeting, the devil repented of his sins and accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior at 72 years of age. Yeah. He went from there down to the Island Creek, and there he was baptized for the remission of his sins through the blood of Jesus washed away in a West Virginia creek. And observers say that for the last 10 years of his life, he was a man marked by peace, knowing that his sins really were taken away. And experts on the feud say that his baptism and, and conversion ultimately brought about the formal end to this feud and changed generations of Hatfields and many others throughout the region. By the time he died, his funeral became the largest attended event in the history of Logan County, West Virginia. And they say that there were many McCoys there present in the audience. If the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse the guilty stains of somebody like Devil Ants Hatfield, then just maybe there's hope for people like you and me. Because what the scripture says is that there are none of us who don't have blood on our hands. That every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we bear the guilt of innocent blood. But what the scripture also says is that there is a city of refuge. There is a safe place to which we can run. That place is Jesus. The avenger of blood is coming. The law says we must die for our sins, but there is a safe refuge. It is Jesus, and we are all called to flee to it. And this city of refuge is better than those we've read about this morning because this city of refuge welcomes the innocent and the guilty alike. We all can run to this city of refuge. And here's the beautiful thing. The scripture says that the high priest whose death takes away the guilt of innocent blood. Well, he died. He died on a cross. The just for the unjust. Innocent blood was shed. And by that innocent blood, what the scripture says is that all our guilty stains are taken away. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And we're invited to run into it that we may be saved. Whatever you may be guilty of today, I invite you to turn and run to Jesus. For this is the promise. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Though your sins be like scarlet today, washed in the blood of Jesus, they shall become white as snow. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord that your love does extend to the guilty, that when we were your enemies, you refrained from retaliating against those who cursed you and spit in your face and pulled out your beard. You, you refrained from retaliation that you might go to the cross and die an unjust death, bearing the weight that our sins rightfully deserved so that we who only deserved condemnation might go free and that you might be both just and the justifier of the ungodly. We thank you for the work of the cross, even as we're about to remember it in this meal. For those who have not received this forgiveness and pardon that you offer, I pray that today might be the day that they run to Jesus, that they fear 
the judgment that is coming because it is coming and that they see the refuge that you've provided in your love that the guilty can run into and be transformed and changed. Lord, we pray that we might see the power of that gospel at work in our lives, in our society, throughout the world. For what the world needs is not simply to protect the innocent and to punish the guilty, but to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, by whose blood we all might be saved. It's in his name we pray. Amen.